Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Dubois. I'm the pastor at Western Mountains Baptist Church located in New Portland, Maine. And uh, we're here this morning continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 7. And as I was uh, putting the sermon together this week, uh, God did kind of a funny thing. Uh, as most of you know, we've been working through uh, the Gospel of Mark, uh, and we are currently in the uh, seventh chapter. In fact, today we are going to finish chapter seven uh, of this Gospel. And, and if you, by any chance, uh, looked ahead, uh, you would have noticed in verse 34, we'll do, by the way, verses 31 through 37 this morning. But in, but in verse 34, Jesus exclaims this, be opened. And, and today... Today, we are opening the, the church building uh, back up, uh, regathering uh, as the body of Christ after 10 weeks with the doors essentially closed. Um, this sermon itself uh, will be recorded uh, ahead of that, uh, that day. Um, but uh, if you're here on Sunday, I look forward to seeing you there. So it, it seems kind of completely appropriate uh, to make this our sermon title today, Be Opened. Uh, and it feels good. It feels good to open the building. We've been working kind of through the details of that all week. Some of us have been here uh, preparing uh, the chairs and cleaning and doing all the things that, that were necessary in order for us to uh, socially distance and, uh, and get people in and out of the building safely and in accordance with the with government standards. Um, and it, it, it'll feel good to, to be amongst uh, all of the people as uh, we realize the importance of seeing one another. And, and it feels good to see and understand the importance of community and to be a part of this Christian community that's been, for me, one of the um, most important lessons that I've learned, I think, through this whole uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, and all that goes with that, uh, the importance of community, the importance of relationships. So we're seeing that kind of come to fruition. Now, this is not at all, this idea of being open, this is not at all the focus of what Jesus is actually doing in this portion of the Gospel of Mark, but it is what God is doing at Western Mountains Baptist Church in June of 2020. And what that tells us is that God's word is living and breathing, right? Right. It's a, it is a valid, it, his word is as valid today and important today as the day God breathed it. So we finally get away from, this morning we get away from the theme of food uh, today as we will see Jesus do yet another miraculous healing. Uh, but before we get to this healing, let's see how Jesus gets there. Uh, beginning with looking at verse 31 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you could grab those and uh, look with me at uh, Mark chapter 7, uh, verse 31. So Mark 7, 31, which reads like this. Again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. Now, we saw last week Jesus have this conversation with this woman from the city of, of Phoenicia, which Tyre is part of. And, and Jesus, because of the faith and persistence of this woman, heals her daughter of demon possession. Now, Jesus leaves the region of Tyre and heads through Sidon, which is actually north of Tyre, and then to the Sea of Galilee, which is southeast of both Tyre and Sidon. Jesus and his disciples then head for the region of Decapolis, a region of 10 Greek cities located south of the Sea of Galilee and east of the Jordan River. And if you look at a map of this kind of this entire region that is being described by Mark this morning, uh, it quickly becomes apparent that Jesus is still avoiding the Jewish towns and cities. Jesus and his crew took the, the long way, if you will, the long way to Decapolis, avoiding even some of the places where they have ministered in the past. They still appear to be avoiding the Pharisees and the scribes, and they still seem to be looking for the opportunity to kind of avoid the crowds, if you will. So with this backdrop, in a Greek region, the account unfolds. Look with me at, now at verse 32. Verse 32 reads like this, they brought him, that is, uh, they brought to him one who was deaf 
and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him, that is Jesus, to lay his hand on him. So last week, last week we saw this one woman who, who figured out who Jesus is and, and she begs him to heal her daughter. And, and now we see in Decapolis, also a, a Gentile city, we see a group of people that have figured out that Jesus is able to heal. And once again, Mark, the gospel writer, is showing us that uh, the reputation of Jesus has preceded him to this place. And, and once again, what we know now is that Jesus cannot escape notice. And Mark tells us that they, whoever they are, uh, bring this man to Jesus. We do not know who they are, and we do not know how many they are. But this we do know. They know that Jesus is special and that Jesus is able to do something for this man, a man who is deaf and who spoke with difficulty or was mute. They bring this man to Jesus and they implore him. They beg him to intervene for this man, to, to heal this man, to lay his hand upon this man. And notice with me, this one thing, their expectation is that Jesus will, will lay his hand on this man and that his touch was necessary for this healing. Now, we know this is not really true. In, in fact, we saw last week, we saw last week Jesus heal the daughter without ever seeing her, without ever touching her. But these folks, these folks, they are asking Jesus to lay his hand on this man in order to heal him. And, and Jesus can work with this, right? He can work with this. He does not require that their faith be like the faith of the woman we saw last week. He just wants to see them exhibit faith. If you remember what he tells his disciples at one point, a mustard seed, the faith of a mustard seed is enough. And in bringing this man to Jesus, they are exhibiting faith. Look with me now at verses 33 and 34 as this account continues. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears. And after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. And looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Mark now gives us a hint that they are enough to be considered a crowd, right? They not are not just one or two people, but, but they are a crowd. And, and, but Jesus, see, Jesus is moved by their request. Jesus is moved by their imploring him. And Jesus then takes this deaf man aside from the crowd and does what the great physician does. Jesus puts his fingers in the man's ears and then Jesus spits and takes his own saliva and touches it to the tongue of the man. <laughs> By the way, uh, as a side note, this kind of healing would, <laughs> it would not pass muster with the CDC now, would it? This, this is against all that Corona stands for. But, but see, Jesus is bigger than Corona, is he not? Well, Jesus does these things, and then Jesus looks to heaven with a, with a deep sigh and says this really hard, hard to pronounce word, right? Aphathra. Now, Remember what we're dealing with. The man is deaf. Jesus takes him aside from the crowd to remove all distractions so that the deaf man could understand what is going on. By, by touching his ears and, and by touching his tongue, Jesus is clearly showing this man his intentions to take care of these two problems, to, to heal him. And, and then Jesus looks, looks heavenward to again clearly show this man from where the power comes to heal him. It's from, it's from God Almighty, from God Almighty. 
Jesus is the conduit, but it is God who cures the man. One of the commentaries I read on this passage said that uh, that word, aphathra, would, would be a word that this man could easily lip read, and so he would understand what Jesus was actually asking God to do. Uh, I'm not a lip reader, but, but the theory at least makes, makes sense to me, and maybe it does to you too. And, and, and what do you suppose happened? We find this in verse 35. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was removed, and he began speaking plainly. See, Mark would not have included this account if the man had not been healed, right? But, but please notice with me that this healing, this healing was full and complete. How do we know this? This is how we know this. His ears were opened, again, using the very words of Jesus in his declaration, and the impediment of his tongue was removed. And the result, the man began speaking plainly. And, and now here's what I hope what we noticed. I, the man did not require speech therapy. The man did not require time and effort to learn or relearn how to speak after being deaf. This is no small feat. He immediately began speaking plainly. See, God's healing is full and complete. This is why we call him the great physician. Have you ever had one of those those kind of hypothetical discussions with, with friends or, or, or others, you know, you know, something like, you know, if you had to lose one of your senses, which would it be? And, and this guy had lost his sense of hearing. One of the senses I would definitely not want to lose. I, I, I love hearing the praise team, sing, team sing praises to our God and King and this morning. And as, as I prepared this sermon, I could hear the birds outside my window and, and I could hear a woodpecker hammering away off in the distance. I, I could hear the wind rustling through the trees. It, it was peaceful. It was, it was relaxing. See, this man could hear none of these things until he met Jesus. And when he met Jesus, his whole life changed. And I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus intends to change the life of each and every one of us. Jesus wants us to meet him and then be changed by him, just like this deaf and mute man in Decapolis. How, how do you need to be healed this morning by the great physician? This man's afflictions were clear to everyone who knew him. And in fact, his afflictions were so clear and so evident that his friends brought him to Jesus and they begged Jesus to heal him. But not all our afflictions are so noticeable or clear, are they? Some of us have suffered hurts. Some of us have suffered betrayals that are obvious only to ourselves. Some of us have suffered significant loss that only we fully can feel and, and understand. Some of us have, have perpetrated hurts on others and, and we carry the burden of, of the guilt and the shame for our, for our actions. And we do this silently and, and tell nobody of our deeds for, for fear of, of being rejected by the ones we love and respect. Friends, these are afflictions that Jesus can heal. These are afflictions that God never intended for us to, to carry around all our lives. Jesus took all these afflictions upon himself when, when he went to the cross and when he hung on that cross. The shedding of his blood was for the purpose of the remission of sin. His shed blood is also intended to remove not just our sin, but also our guilt and our shame. See, 
I believe one of Satan's greatest triumphs is convincing us that we must continue to suffer under the weight of these past sins, either, either suffered at the hands of others or, or the sins that we ourselves have committed. But this flies in the face of what we can read in Romans 5, verse 8, when, which tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. No more need to, to suffer in silence. No more need to, to carry the burden around with us day in and day out. Christ died so that we would be free from the weight of this burden. See, that's how much he loves us. Well, this account has not yet come to its conclusion. Look, look with me now at verses 36 and 37. And they read like this. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone. But the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. They were utterly astonished, saying, He has done all, the, all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Now, we have seen Jesus do this a number of times throughout uh, this gospel where he heals somebody or, or casts out a demon and, and then tells the recipient that they should not tell anyone. In fact, in this case, the language is pretty strong. Jesus orders them not to tell anyone. And, and here we see that Jesus is not just speaking to the deaf mute who's been healed, but, but also to the people that brought this man to Jesus in the first place. But they have seen something miraculous. They have seen God respond to their petition. They have seen their faith rewarded. And Mark says, the more Jesus ordered them to stay quiet, the more widely they proclaimed this miraculous healing. They testified to what they had seen Jesus accomplish. And I, and I love that Mark actually shares what at least some of them were saying as they testified. In their astonishment, they were saying that this Jesus has done all things well. Then specifically, Jesus makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. In other words, they are telling anyone who would listen, Jesus completely heals. Jesus did not give this man a little bit of his hearing, but he gave him all of it. Jesus did not just make the man somewhat intelligible in his speech. The man can now speak plainly. His healing, Jesus' healing, is a complete work. And friends, it's the same with us. His perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind is also a finished, complete work. And Jesus declares it himself on the cross when he exclaims, it is finished. But here is what I have seen sometimes in myself and, and, and sometimes in others. See, we, we believe in, in the finished work of Christ, but, but once in a while, once in a while, we pick up what we have already put down at the foot of the cross. We re-carry the burden of a sin all over again. We carry the weight of the guilt or the shame all over again. These people in Decapolis recognized the full and complete work of Jesus, and, and, and we need to do the same thing. We, we need to trust his forgiveness. We, we need to believe in his substitutionary atonement. We need to believe that, that he took my sins upon himself and placed them as far as the east is from the west, and he remembers them no more. Why? so we can walk in freedom so we can serve him with these without carrying these same burdens so that we can serve him gladly for what he has done on our behalf 
I was talking with someone this week about the art of finishing. In my engineering world, there have always been contractors who, who I've worked with who can, who can literally build anything I've designed, but, but some contractors seem unwilling or, or unable to finish, to, to leave the project site in a truly finished state. Some carpenters have this, this same problem. They can build almost anything, but, but they sometimes have trouble completely finishing their project. Jesus, my friends, does not have this same problem. The people in Decapolis recognized this in him, and so must we. Jesus is a great finisher. When he declared to this man's ears, be opened, his ears were completely opened. When Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through me, he means it. When Jesus declares that he is the vine and we are the branches and apart from him, we can do nothing, it's a true and faithful statement. When Jesus declares that he is the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will live even if he dies, and, and everyone who believes, who lives and believes in me will never die, he means it. See, the question for all of us is simple. Do we believe? And my hope this morning, my prayer for all of us is that we would believe. That we would believe in the finished work of Christ Jesus and then live in that truth. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are grateful for the example of the people of Decapolis who brought this man to Jesus for, for healing. And, and Lord, we, we love to see how you work in and through people, Lord, by healing this man. You have these folks that, that bear witness to that finished work. And Lord, you call us to do the same, to bear witness to your finished work in us. May we be faithful to do just that. And we pray these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, I love you all and look forward to seeing you all soon.